Hello, I'm Rhys Bowen. I write the Molly Murphy Mysteries, a historical mystery series set in early 1900s New York City, and the lighter, funnier Royal Spinist series, featuring a minor royal in the 1930s. I also write several big standalones, the latest of which is the Venice Sketchbook, and I love listening to the Dark and Stormy Book Club podcast. Hello, and welcome to episode 176 of Dark and Stormy Book Club. Today, we have our What We Are Reading for July. Enjoy. I'm Ann Dart. I'm Tracy Stormy. And I'm Kathy Knight. And together, we are... It Was a Dark and Stormy Book Club. A podcast for mystery lovers. Welcome. If you enjoy our show, please consider contributing to the Dark and Stormy Patreon. By becoming a patron, you will help us create better and quality content. There are also benefits to becoming a patron, such as exclusive content and Dark and Stormy merchandise. Become a supporter at patreon.com slash darkandstormybc. Check our website for the link. We appreciate any and all contributions. Thank you. Here it is. The hot summer month of July during a thunderstorm. And we have three books to recommend as what we are reading. July edition. The first book that I have is called The Stranger Diaries. It's by Ellie Griffiths. It was put out in March of 2019 by Mariner Books. It's no secret that Ellie Griffiths is one of my favorite authors. I fell in love with Ruth Galloway. Then when she came out with the Max Mephisto series, I'm always clamoring for her next book. But this is a standalone. It came out last year, and I was a little bit hesitant to read it, only because I was afraid of losing something. You know how you cherish the characters, and this wasn't going to be them. I should have trusted Ellie and her talent. I was not only not disappointed, but I found a new favorite character, and I hope this one continues. Now, Claire is just an average high school English teacher, but she specializes in the Gothic writer. R. M. Holland. I guess he was sort of a Stephen King in the bygone era. She teaches at a school that used to be R. M. Holland's home. She is doing research on his life and writing a book about him. She just has an average life. Well, her friend and another teacher at the school is murdered. She and Ella had a history and a history that Claire really doesn't want brought into public knowledge. She and this woman went out together to dinners. They were colleagues. She is just absolutely shocked. One of the things that Claire does, she keeps a diary. She writes a diary about everything that's going on in her life. Her daughter, she writes about things that are going on at the school, and she writes notes about this R.M. Holland that she's doing research on. She writes in her diary all about the murder of Ella, her friend. One day, she picks up her diary, and she opens it up, and it says, Hello, Claire. You don't know me. It talks? No, it's written on the page. Her, creepy. She carries her diary with her at all times. It is always in her desk at school. She is totally freaked out, but she also is curious about what happened with Ella, and she's looking into things that are going on, but she keeps getting these strange messages in her diary. Finally, she meets Detective Sergeant Harbinder Cower. Oh, what a name. Harbinder Cower is the neatest character. She is a Sikh, 
She lives at home with her parents, of course, because she's a single young woman. She is raised by a family that their focus in life is to get her married, which will be a little difficult because she's a lesbian, and food. The food in this book, your mouth waters (laughs) while you're reading it. This is the character that I fell in love with. She is just very, very well written. And I hope that Ellie continues with her story. She is an excellent character. But anyway, back to Claire. She becomes quite friendly with Harbinder, and she's investigating the case with her. She has a 15-year-old daughter named George, and part of this book is written in George's voice, part of it's written in Claire's voice, and part of it's written in Harbinder's voice. In this instance, this works. Sometimes that can be a distraction, but in this book, it melds together, and it is very well done. George is also a writer. She is in a group at school learning how to write, and she has a 21-year-old boyfriend. Now, why a mother would let a 15-year-old date a 21-year-old, I don't know. These are the main characters, and there's a few others that are hovering around in the background, but they don't matter that much. This was an excellent book. I had it solved about three quarters of the way through the book. The ending was a surprise. Ellie Griffiths is the master of putting in red herrings, and I was suckered in by her red herring that she put in there. (laughs) That's easy to do with her. Yes, it is. I highly recommend this book. Do not think that you're going to lose any of your love affair with Ruth or with Max Mephisto, Harbinder is a great addition to this group. Ellie Griffiths is the author of the Ruth Galloway and the Max Mephisto, which she calls the Brighton Mystery Series. She has also published a children's book called A Girl Called Justice. I remember her talking about that on the show. Yes, and she has also written books under her real name, which is Domenica De Rosa. What a sexy name. Yeah. Uh, I would be using that one. The Ruth books are all set in Norfolk, and that's where Ellie grew up. She lives in Brighton with her husband, Andy, who is an archaeologist. She has two grown children. She writes in a garden shed with her cat, Gus. And her website is elliegriffiths.com. Well, I went the true crime route for mine. I have always wanted to read this book, so I thought, well, why not now? The Killer Across the Table, Unlocking the Secrets of Serial Killers and Predators with the FBI's Original Mindhunter. This was put out a couple years ago, May 7th of 2019 by William Morrow. 20 years after his famous memoir, the man who literally wrote the book on FBI criminal profiling opens his case files once again. In a riveting work of true crime, he spotlights four of the most diabolical criminals he ever confronted, interviewing and learning from going deep into each man's life and crimes. He outlines the factors that led them to murder and how he used his interrogation skills to expose their means, motive, and true evil. Like the hit Netflix show, The Killer Across the Table is centered around Douglas' unique interrogation and profiling processes. With his longtime collaborator, Mark Olshaker, Douglas recounts the chilling encounters with these four killers as he experiences them, revealing for the first time his profile methods in detail. Going step-by-step through the interviews, Douglas explains how he connects each killer's crime to the specific conversation and contrasts these encounters with those of the deadly criminals to show what he learns from each in a process. 
He returns to other famous cases, killers, and interviews that have shaped his career, describing how the knowledge he gained from those exchange helped prepare him for these. A glimpse into the mind of the man who has pierced the heart of human darkness, the killer across the table, unlocks the ultimate mysteries of depravity, techniques, and approaches that have countered evil in the name of justice. Oh my goodness. There is so much wonderfulness about this book. Yes, it is a very dark story. And yes, it goes into detail about their crime. Maybe I just have a very dark side, but I learned so much from reading this book. How to Catch a Killer. <laughs> I listened to the audio of this book. To my sheer delight, it was Jonathan Groff, who was the narrator of this book, from Mindhunter and from my favorite, King George of Hamilton. I would get lost in his voice. And yes. I felt like it was the show Mindhunter reenacting some of this. Oh, it was the perfect casting in this book. He is a wonderful actor. And he did a great job reading the narrative. I wonder if he wore his crown. <laughs> we can only hope. In this book, Ron Douglas goes step by step on how he interviewed these four notorious serial killers. And when I say notorious, I don't mean your I hate to call it household serial killers. Everybody not, has one. not not like your John Gacy or your stalker. Um, yeah, these are ones that you might not have heard of, or if you have, you probably heard more about the crime, but you did not hear about the killer himself. So the ones he did in this book were Joseph McGowan. He was convicted of murdering a seven-year-old Girl mm -hmm. Scout that knocked on his door to sell him Girl Scout cookies. It's a horrendous story. These are all true. These are all very true. Then you have Joseph Condro, who was convicted of murdering an eight-year-old and then later a 12-year-old. Yeah, I mean, these are not easy stories to read. These are not bedtime stories. <laughs> then you have Donald Harvey. You've probably heard of this man. He was referred to as the Angel of Death. He murdered 37 people while an orderly and nurse's aide at a hospital. Then you have Todd Colhept, who murdered seven people and also kept a woman captive inside of a shipping container for two months before she was discovered. I read about this guy. Yeah. And me, like millions of other people, are obsessed with true crime. This is a very dark book, but I feel like it's a necessary book. I always use the adage, when I go in the ocean, I'm afraid of sharks. So I want to know what there is to know about sharks to make sure I never get attacked by a shark. Well, that's kind of what I feel about these guys. Like, I want to know the ins and outs of how their mind ticks. So I make sure that I keep me and my family protected. I think that's where my angle comes in for being obsessed with true crime. But I thought John Douglas did such a great job of giving us really in-depth details, but he never once put any of these killers up on a pedestal because there are a lot of true crime books that are solely about how they were almost like rock stars. There was a whole thing where serial killer baseball cards came out. John makes us know these are bad people, and he treated them like bad people. His job, he could not beat them up or anything. <laughs> these are also people that John interviewed after he was an FBI agent. He had already retired from the agency. So some of these interviews came about because they were going to make a TV show about some of these. He did not have a lot of the rights that he had as an agent. He was still granted these interviews. And what's funny about it is the killers all kind of knew that he was not as powerful as he once were. And they could end the interview anytime they wanted. They were like, I don't want to talk to you anymore. So I've read all of the books that they've written together. They are all highly recommended. They did use some other famous crimes to kind of let us know 
the insight of what the thinking process was with these gentlemen. Like, say, Son of Sam, they would talk about a crime that 